كو بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته مساكم الله بالخير everywhere um, it's my pleasure and honor to be uh, with you again on this wonderful educational platform provided by Minasu um, my name is Ali Khatami I'm neurology and stroke uh, consultant working at National Guard Health Affairs in Riyadh and I have a wonderful group this is our uh, monthly grand round um, I uh, would like first to welcome our guest Dr. Fahad Al-Ajlan who is one of our panelists Dr. Fahad Al-Ajlan is a senior consultant at King Faisal Specialist Hospital in Riyadh he's a stroke neurologist and he's a researcher he is our guest today. Also, we have our panelists, all the consultants from National Guard Health Affairs, the stroke program. And we have uh, four of our fellows who are doing a great job and uh, they're going to share with us today <coughs> their, um, uh, their work on the last month preparing for their topic. Uh, we have uh, selected common questions from a stroke surface um, and uh, the our grand round typically is a very informal and uh, back and forth discussion and challenging sometimes. So we're going to have a discussion with our panels and uh, with our fellows. Um, you can see the agenda. We have three cases, a quite uh, challenging uh, diagnostic and therapeutic dilemmas that uh, we may encounter sometimes. We're talking. We're going to talk about carotid stenosis in the setting of. Um, Cabbage, um, another clinical dilemma, which is uh, and, uh, hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage in the setting of mechanical valve and anticoagulation. We're going to talk about the stroke around surgery and how can we stratify the risk and all of this. Uh, we're going to learn today a lot of things through clinical cases and discussion. And I will hand um, the mic to uh, Dr. Uh, Zaid Al Saran, who is uh, one of our great fellows, uh, he is in his second um, uh, year uh, of fellowship. Uh, Zaid is a is a neurologist who graduated from King Saudi University in Riyadh. Uh, he got his medical school there, and then he pursued his his um, uh, residency training uh, program in the same center. In the same center, and uh, last year he joined us and. He's almost there to be a, a, um, a stroke neurologist. He's going to moderate the session and take the questions and um, you know, um, coordinate and facilitate the discussion between the panelists. Um, uh, Dr. Zaid, can you, can you uh, start and take the mic, please? Great. Thank you, Prof, uh, for the introduction. I don't think I need to talk more. However, I just want to thank again the uh, uh, Middle East uh, North African Stroke Organization for this uh, educational activity. So I'll go, I'm, going, I'm going to start uh, directly to the presentations. So we'll talk first about our first speaker who is Dr. Faisal Dwebi, and he is going to talk today about carotid stenosis in the setting of coronary artery disease and need for cabbage. Uh, Dr. Dwebi obtained his bachelor degree about in medicine in Ibn Sina National College in 2015 in Jeddah. Then he joined King Fahad Military Hospital in Jeddah, where he did his resi residency and graduated uh, that there. Uh, currently, he's our uh, Stork uh, Fellow or Vascular Neurology Fellow and currently doing his first year. So, Dr. Faisal, without further ado, you can start. Thank you, Dr. Zaid, and I would thank uh, the organized committee and uh, all the panelists, and I would thank uh, Prof. Ali and Dr. Onoran for this opportunity. I will try to share the, the slide, but it cannot be... It's not allowed to share the... Try again now, doctor. It's working. Great, it's showing right now. You can start. And just oh. a reminder to the audience that there is Q&A section. So if you have any questions, try to answer it, inshallah. 
Okay. Uh, today we're going to talk. Uh, today we're going to talk about the carotid stenosis in setting of coronary artery uh, disease in need for cabbage. Uh, Uh, this is a, a typical scenario from the consultation from the consultation team. We were consulted by cardiology services to evaluate a 70 years old male who's known to have diabetic hypertension, dyslipidemia for clearance before a semi-elective uh, cabbage and recommendation regarding the right ICA severe stenosis. Uh, the patient is denied any symptoms suggestive of hemispheric or retinal stroke or TIA, the CT brain was normal. CT and you show there is right ICA 80 stenosis and left ICA less than 40. The echo show the ejection fraction of 35 to 40% with akinesia of Apex. And coronary as you show, there is a left uh, anterior descending stenosis, 80% stenosis and circumference 80 stenosis. Okay, so we'll go to the first question in the poll. Um, I'd like to ask the audience if they can answer this question. So what do you do, do next? So first, first thing is, would you proceed with a cabbage surgery? Would you revascularize the right ICA followed by cabbage? I was going to commit revascularization and cabbage, or if you need any more information, we'll give you 30 seconds to try to answer it. And we'll see the answer after all. Is the folding working, uh, Zaid? Uh, I'm not quite sure. I cannot actually fold here. It's it's working, actually. And it's very interesting uh, so far, the answers. So, Professor Ali, uh, panelists cannot vote on this. Only attendees will be able to vote. That's why. Uh, okay. I thought I should, uh, I should vote anyway. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so far we passed more than around or around 50% of the participant or the attendees uh, voted. Um, it's very interesting actually the answer. So most of them are split between the three, either proceed or they can do the revascularization before the cabbage and or some of them need more information. So can we end maybe the poll? Yeah, you can end the poll. Okay, so one of the experts, if you can take opinion, uh, Dr. Anuran. So what do you think about this scenario and what would you do if you face this? Uh, yeah, hi Zaid and uh, hi everyone. Hi. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you again. Uh, so actually this patient, he's my patient and the consult okay. came, came to me while I was on the service. And uh, this patient, he is... Uh, a physician working at the college. So he's a well-educated guy, still working and active at the age of 70. And his daughter was even one of the ICU physician. Uh, knowing that the patient was completely free from the symptoms and uh, clinically he was totally normal. And the uh, exam was normal in IH0. The CT brain didn't show any silent infarct before. And there is nothing acute. Uh, on the same time that knowing that they need to go for the cabbage and he's at the risk of having another MI, I actually elected to proceed for cabbage and uh, delay the stent later after stabilizing his cardiac problem. Excellent. So, okay. so you elected to proceed with cabbage alone? Yes. Okay. Maybe, maybe Zaid, if you, if you can uh, hear from other uh, any any anyone no, no. panelist, if he has different opinion. Dr. Adal, Dr. Khatri, Dr. Ajman, Dr. Fahad. Does anyone has a different opinion or different thought? Um, I have um, Adal Khalaf is my name. Thanks um, for having me here. And I think um, what we need, um, I, I would need more information about the um, the stenosis. What kind of stenosis is ulcerating? Is it not ulcerating? Um, how is this 80 percent? Um, but if it's ulcerated, um, it means um, embolization um, potential is there, and um, it might um, be a source of strokes, ischemic strokes. Okay. So, 
That's my opinion. So okay. you wanted to further study the the, the carotid stenosis, correct? Yes, black black um, um, study just to see the plaque if it's uh, unstable plaque, ulcerating plaque, or um, um, in vulnerable uh, plaque, as um, always um, focus or mention. Fahad, Fahad, what is the practice in, in King Faisal? What do you do for these patients? You know, I'll, I'll, t I'll try some of the cases to play the devil advocate. So even if I, you know, because this is clearly, as you mentioned, Brok uh, from the beginning is it's not the straightforward cases, slam dunk, that we have one opinion. Uh, I need to know about uh, the brain MR because you might have some hits on the DWI that was not clinically uh, uh, evident on the patient. However, it's indicated an active carotid. And if you want to game the, you want to take the game further, probably uh, you could do a transcranial Doppler and see if the uh, left ICA is actively uh, embolizing. Uh, in addition to what Dr. Adal Khaf uh, mentioned about the carotid plaque, it's not only the degree, it's the morphology and all of these details. Um, I, I would love to to know about it. Second thing, I would know. Uh, I want to know the. Uh, pre-morbid medical optimization. Uh, how, is, how is his LDL, his blood pressure, all of these things, we take it for granted, uh, but I think uh, we need always to optimize it in an, uh, before taking the patient to surgery or consider surgery. Okay, great. I think that's bo both of them as valid, uh, valid things to think about before doing, uh, before proceeding with the cabbage. Uh, so, uh, the professor, if you can continue and see what the literature say. Okay, thank you, Aurelia. Yes. Okay. Okay. As the preoperative stroke risk during and post cabbage, the incidence of stroke after the cabbage is one to two percent. The majority, seventy to eighty of stroke. Uh, during or after the cabbage day coming from the embolism by uh, after aortic manipulations, the minority from 20 to 30 percent following the hypoperfusions and post operative stroke they divide it in, in, in uh, within the if it is within the seven days, it's usually due to dysarrhythmia. If it is between uh, seven days to 30 days, they usually the cause is uh, generalized atherosclerosis. Uh, in intraoperative stroke, uh, during the cardiac uh, operations, the significant mortality is 29% versus 18% uh, with postoperative stroke, versus 2.4 in patient does not have a stroke. Uh, this is uh, it depend on the 30 day 30 day mortality. So. From this, we can say that the most of the mortality coming from the post cabbage is coming from the stroke. Uh, in this meta-analysis, 106 observational study report that the cabbage uh, patient with uh, more than 50% carotid stenosis, they have the risk of 7% seven, uh, 7 in, in perioperative uh, stroke. And this percent would increase with increasing of the stenosis. Uh, in this study, the most, uh, the highest rate of post-operative stroke, it's coming from if the patient has period TIA or stroke, or if he had a carotid occlusion. In post-cabbage stroke, 18% of patients with unoperated symptomatic unilateral. And this percent will increase to 26% if the patient have bilateral 70 to 99% stenosis or contralateral occlusion. Uh, here in this database from the Society of Thoracic Surgeon, Adult Cardiac Surgery, they found that uh, in, 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 in two uh, thirds of underwent stage, uh, that means if they do carotid endarctomy before doing the cabbage or synchronous, if they do it together, uh, for those who are neurologically asymptomatic, 73% uh, of those asymptomatic carotid stenosis, there is no difference between the two arm 
in the hospital stroke patient, those who have asynchronous uh, or those who have isolated cabbage. In reviewing of almost uh, 6,000 of cardiac surgery, half of them, they are underwent to uh, a, a carotid ultrasound. 7.4% of them, they have more than 70% carotid stenosis, which is asymptomatically. They found that who's uh, undergoing a carotid endectomy barrier to cardiac surgery, they have a higher perioperative stroke. Uh, as well as they have significant higher rate of perioperative MI. In this RCT, they are comparing uh, between the safety and efficacy of combined simultaneous. They are including all the, the, uh, the carotid stenosis, more than 80, depend on ACAST criteria, or more than 70%, depend on uh, NACET criteria. They, they following them for five, five years and uh, for regarding the non-fatal stroke or death, they found it's the same, 40% and 35% between the two arms. And actually during the first year, there was a higher, uh, higher non-fatal stroke and death for the, those patients who, uh, who having uh, the simultaneous procedure. And this is the guidelines, the European guidelines. They mentioned that for coronary artery bypass, patient with asymptomatic unilateral 70 to 99% carotid stenosis, who uh, the stage or synchronous carotid intervention is not recommended for prevention of post-operative stroke. However, for coronary artery bypass for cabbage who have a bilateral asymptomatic 70 to 99% carotid stenosis, or those who have a contralateral occlusion, the stage or synchronous uh, carotid in, uh, interventions may be considered. And depend on the guideline based on our decision, our case, this patient is with a proceed for cabbage and he is asymptomatic and he is asymptomatic and he have a unilateral carotid stenosis, 70 to 99%. This patient depend on the guidelines. They can they can uh, proceed for isolated cabbage, uh, and no need for carotid interventions. Thank you very much. Wonderful, uh, very concise uh, presentation. Thank you, Faisal. Uh, so it seems that the I think from your presentation it seems that the guideline and the data. Of literature showing that they prefer to defer from doing the procedure. Uh, yeah. Although with some of the, I mean, one of the uh, uh, the panelists think that there is another thing beyond the guideline. So aside from these points that was mentioned, uh, so Dr. Abdal, do you think other than that, beside the uh, microthrombi by TCD or black imaging that showing ulceration, for example, patient if he has incomplete uh, Circular fullest, does that help also to go for endarticulum or revascularization, do you think? Well, what I think is in, in, in such cases, we are moving now to a treatment of asymptomatic um, carotid um, internal stenosis. So um, in such cases, there is if the patient, vulnerable patient and um, vulnerable stenosis, and if we have, um, um, if we complete all uh, possible test, uh, tests, to see the morphology of the stenosis, what's the patient um, um, condition? And um, I think it's he such patient, if they are vulnerable patient, vulnerable stenosis, they might benefit from um, carotid procedure um, in such cases because we are preventing them from um, ischemic and, and ischemic stroke because the, the cabbage um, duration, the operation duration, it is too long. Associated with um, um, with mobilization of black um, and from the aorta, um, it could be um, also there. There is um, also source of um, emboli, um, AFib. It is it is it could be other causes uh, other than um, carotid. But in, in in vulnerable patients, I think the carotid. If we can make the carotid guilty for such um, um, infarction, I do. I would. 
I would more tend to do um, intervention before um, cabbage, before, not okay. simultaneous, before. Okay, but, okay, yeah. great. Z Z okay. Can, great. Can, I, can I comment on this, please? I, I need to disagree with, uh, <laughs> with Abdel, and then, then please give the mic to Fahad to hear from him. Or sure. From Ali. Oh. We still have time, so we, inshallah we have time for discussion. So, so Adal, you wanted to further characterize the flag yes. and try to understand the risk uh, further. Yes. The, the, um, someone is making noise here. So, <laughs> so basically, um, carotid, cont carotid stenosis contribute in preoperative uh, stroke after cabbage in only 20% of the cases. Yeah. So 8% mm. has nothing to do with the carotid stenosis. It's coming from the aorta, it's coming from the heart, from the manipulations, from the atrial fibrillations, whatever. It's, it's cardioembolic or, or from the arch. Uh, so 20% only are contributed into, um, uh, contributed into the stroke uh, preoperatively. So the risk is about 1% to 2% overall, maybe 5%. 80% of those risks are not related to carotid. Why do you want to go, to go and, and operate on them? Maybe if I had to, and, uh, can, can pick this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's the point that I want to allude to, Ali, is that when we talk about stroke during cabbage, it has nothing to do most of the time with the carotid. It is coming from another source because we see a lot of patients without carotid stenosis, they are having a stroke due to the reason that you alluded to, either manipulating the arch or inducing atrial fibrillation or another etiology that we are not aware of, or a low flow that is not related to the carotid. Second thing, and I would, uh, you know, I heard this from one of the Henry Barnett uh, trainee uh, who trained me. He said in 1994, Henry Barnett said, it's difficult to make a symptomatic patient better. That was in the era before, our modern modulization of the risk factor. So personally, I feel we should not treat asymptomatic patient uh, carotid except in a very special population. And uh, what we learn from surgery, the moment that you do two surgery at the same time, going from one valve to double valve, going from cabbage alone to cabbage with carotid, your risk of stroke and complication go exponentially. So that's why I tend to keep it simple if it's asymptomatic. So the vast majority of the time, I would go only with one uh, procedure. Okay. So if, let, let me ask you this question. Uh, I used to do this before the recent uh, RCT. Um, I, I used to look into the circle of Wallace and see whether the hemisphere is isolated, if there is no uh, anterior communicating artery, uh, posterior communicating artery, and that entire hemisphere is just living on that carotid. Uh, and um, uh, you, you know what happened during cardiac surgery with blood pressure, it just goes up and down, but despite the, all the efforts of anesthesia uh, team, if you prove that with the CTA that he has isolated hemisphere, incomplete circle of Wallace, and the entire hemisphere is living only on this carotid, would you consider revascularization before cabbage? You know, a lot of people are going to criticize me for this, but I'm not sure that complete circular pulse or incomplete circular pulse plays a major role in, uh, in decision. I think mm -hmm. the fact has to do with the big picture. Are we dealing with a symptomatic carotid in, in addition to that? Or probably the flow here is, is enough. Uh, you know, you don't need 100% of the flow. Just you don't need a noisy carotid. I think that's the equation for me. Uh, just I need a carotid that does not throw a thrombi. But 20% of those flow, I think, is enough. Uh, especially that during cabbage, they are aiming for a lower map. So I don't think the flow itself will be uh, a major problem. Personally, I think uh, I would go with a conservative approach unless I have a clue that this carotid is an active carotid. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, just to keep in time. May I add, may I add a comment? Uh, my point is in, in, in vulnerable patient, if I have a carotid stenosis with um, showering potential, um, with intra-black hemorrhage, um, with ulceration, 
in such cases, I would go for, because we are moving, as I said, from asymptomatic carotid stenosis treatment in such cases. But if, um, if the carotid is vulnerable here, and it's potential for, um, um, or I, I, I can um, well predict that it's a, a high risk patient, I would go for it. In, in, in a normal carotid, 80% um, stenosis um, um, without um, uh, ulceration, I would not. Just to, to clarify my point. Okay. Thank you. Ismail, Zaid Ismail has a question, has a, has a okay. okay. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you all for Assalamu. joining and thank you all for this very interesting discussion. So I want to just make a point that we are here in situation where the carotid study has already been done. But I want to go one step back and see, do we actually need to image carotid arteries before cabbage? And I think we will continue to see as a stroke specialist these consults of asymptomatic carotid disease. But looking at big picture, if the patient is going for cabbage, I think most of the, our current understanding tells us that we don't even need to image the carotid if the patient has never had symptoms. Yes, so that is actually, another yeah. part of the equation. Ismail, that can I say something here? Sometimes sometime it's good to live in ignorance. So that's yeah. why five years back, we went to our cardiologist because the carotid Doppler was part of the pre-op evaluation for uh, cabbage. We yeah. told them we don't want to know. Just don't yeah, do it unless the patient needed. is symptomatic. If he's yeah. symptomatic, yeah. go with CTA. Don't go with yeah. carotid. But, but I have so, to say, though, that this approach, Ismail and Fahad, probably this approach is not, this is, again, is the new trend of precision medicine, personalization of, of, of care. I do believe someone, I mean, we know that carotid stenosis is a definite risk factor for preoperative stroke. But the things that we, we also might know, although the evidence is very low, that treating these patients to revascularize does not re decrease the the, the risk. Um, I, I'm not quite sure, but having information to stratify the risk, counseling the patient, the family, the surgeon, the anesthesia, taking care of the blood pressure during intra-op, um, all of these are very important information, even if we decide not to revascularize. But but uh, it, it is quite interesting. Do we need to do it? And, and when we find it, um, uh, you operate on bilateral, the guidelines. How would you pick up the bilateral if you don't screen? Right? So yeah. I do believe that we, we, we will continue to have a significant clinical dilemma, but at least um, uh, we were very enthusiastic uh, for, for uh, revascularization until 2018 um, when the data came and, you know, it's not that uh, encouraging, but uh, I do still believe that there is a subgroup of patients who benefits from revascularization uh, so far is the bilateral or unilateral with a contralateral yeah. severe, um, sorry, unilateral stenosis with contralateral occlusion or bilateral uh, uh, stenosis. And the question, which one you revascularize? Uh, is it the left or the right? And there are a lot of questions ongoing, and I know Zaid is going to kill us to uh, to stop <laughs> here and take yes. the next case. Yes, yes. That, yeah, I think, yeah, we have, Maybe less than one minute or 30 seconds, Dr. Anurran, you want to add one more comment before we move? Yeah, I will add uh, the comment how I made the decision for this patient <laughs> and to answer the uh, question raised by Dr. Fahad. So uh, he's a guy with a very well-controlled risk factor. His hemoglobin A1C is around 7 point something. He got a very well-controlled hypertension. He's not a smoker, a very highly educated guy. And uh, my point was only to make sure that he is truly asymptomatic clinically and imaging wise, uh, even by MRI. I actually didn't image the plaque through uh, the plaque imaging, but it was an ultrasound and a CTA. And the CTA, there was no free floating component, no soft plaque. Uh, this is as far as I remember. So uh, we planned for the cabbage and we said, Yes, after that, we might discuss that being a very highly functioning guy that we might consider the a stenting or doing something for this carotid, but later, but the uh, main treatment is to treat his cardiac problem. 
and uh, that's it okay uh, so we'll, one of the Q&A question was is the patient with ICA stenosis and the risk of a stroke is cabbage not a further risk of stroke uh, preoperatively as we mentioned that and uh, the question is it, the cabbage itself it can be with manipulation it is a risk of a stroke so we'll move to the second uh, speaker uh, Dr. Mohammed Shamari and he's going to talk about resumption of anticoagulation in patient with ICH and mechanical valve or mechanical heart valve. Uh, just a brief introduction, Dr. Mohammed obtained his bachelor degree in medicine in King Saud University in Riyadh, and then he joined King Abdulaziz Medical City in Riyadh, Minister of National Guard, where he did his uh, neurology residency, and currently he's our fellow uh, in, uh, in first year. And without further ado, Mohammed, you can start. Thank you, Zaid, for this introduction. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. So, uh, as Dr. Zaid mentioned, uh, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee for having me and the uh, panelists, including Dr. Dr. Uh, Ali and Dr. Noran, and uh, all the uh, people, panelists who helped me to uh, present this uh, case. So, I would like to talk about the assumption of anticoagulation in patients with intracranial hemorrhage and mechanical heart valves. So we'll start with the case. So this is a 70 year old lady with history of diabetes and hypertension for 10 years. In 2010, she developed shortened breath and she was diagnosed with mitral valve regurgitations and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. In 2012, she had an implanted metallic mitral valve and she was started in warfarin. And in 2016, she was diagnosed with, with heart block and had a permanent pacemaker. So in 2022, before her presentation to our hospital, she woke up with severe headache, slurring of speech, left-sided weakness associated with altered mental status. She was rushed by her sons to the emergency. She was normal glycemic with a normal blood pressure uh, of 140 over 89. So stroke code was activated and stroke team saw her and she had, she had an NIH of 16, for right hemispheric syndrome with decreased level of consciousness. So she was rushed to the brain, to the CT department and she did a uh, brain CT. <clears throat> so for non-neurologists, non-radiologists, this is a brain CT, axial cut. This is the right side of the brain. This is the left side of the brain. And we can see this whitish area, the hyperdense on the right hemisphere in the front to parietal area and having surrounding uh, edema and midline shift. And another note about this scan, there is a multifocal uh, morphology, which give you a hint, this is probably a high-risk bleed. So her, her INR was 6.6, .6, her hemoglobin was 13, and she had an urgent echo, which showed a functioning my mechanical mitral valve with the normal ejection fraction. So now going to the pool. So we have a clinical dilemma here. We have a patient with a mechanical heart valve and warfarin, and had an ICH. So we have to weigh a benefit and risk, uh, risk of hematoma expansion if we lift this patient without a reversal and risk of thromboembolism and prostatic valve thrombosis if the patient was reversed. Uh, excellent, uh, So we'll, uh, we can have the poll now and so, uh, we'll give you 30 seconds. So the option R is immediately normalize INR to, to, uh, to less than 1.3, or immediately bring INR to therapeutic range between two and three, or hold warfarin watch closely, repeat CT in, 24, in 84 hours. Okay. Okay, Akilash, maybe if you can stop the voting now and we'll take the opinion, the experts about it. Okay, actually 27% of the part of the attendees participated. Actually, it was a surprise for me. At least the result is surprising. Uh, so mm -hmm. most of the people will hold the orphan and watch closely. They will not reverse it, although the INR is around six. So 
maybe Dr. Khatri, you want like to comment on this? What would you do in this situation? Well, this is very interesting poll result if this mm. is so. <laughs> but what we know is that that people do have medication associated hemorrhages even where when they are therapeutic in their INR. So we know that warfarin does increase the risk of hemorrhage, primary intracerebral, I mean, intracerebral hemorrhage itself, or it can increase the primary intracerebral hemorrhage. So whenever I see hemorrhage and somebody has a coagulopathy that could be reversed potentially, I tend to reverse because we know that hematoma expansion in itself is one of the greatest risk for morbidity and mortality. And the difficult part is that most of the hematoma expansion occurs early. So if we see the patients early, then I would approach to be on the safe side and try to reverse it rather than bringing down to therapeutic range because we know that even in therapeutic range, there could be risk of further expansion. So I would tend to choose for the first choice of immediately trying to normalize the INR or any other coagulopathy in such situation, if I know of, to decrease the mm -hmm. risk of hematoma expansion. Now, in this particular case, Muhammad has already told us that the heart is looking good otherwise. But we know that even if a heart has to cause a thromboembolic event, it takes time for the mm -hmm. embolic events to happen. And if INR of 6.6 .6 did not prevent that heart from forming a clot, I don't think that keeping it there will help any further. So this is my take on this poll. Okay, great. Any other comments from the panelists? Well, we can... Is it maybe a question? How many hours the CT from onset again? Uh, Muhammad? Maybe. Uh, so it was a stroke. One hour. Stroke code, immediate. Stroke. One hour. Muhammad, if you look, go back to the scan again, so if you applied what we call the BAT score uh, for this patient, it's going to score five out of five because there is a hypodensity and there is a blend sign and the patient is presenting less than 2.5 hours. It is at a highest risk for hematoma expansion, not to factor in the oral anticoagulation and not to factor in the scary 6.6. .6. So yeah. that's the three points I want to uh, mention. And okay. what is even more important, and uh, this is my statement, and I believe in it strongly, an oral anticoagulation associated intracerebral hemorrhage, if the bleed is small, you don't want it to be medium. If it's medium, you don't want it to be large. If it's large, mm. you don't want it to be killing. Because in this patient, if you don't reverse it, guess what? you're going to go from subfalcian to central herniation, and their patient is going to die much faster than what you think. And we are dealing with a scary number, which is 6.6. .6. Uh, I don't care about the heart. The heart, we can fix it later on. Believe me, the patient will not tamponade immediately. But the mm. brain will not like that. So that's my take on this case. Good. Um, so, Mohammed, maybe if you can continue. Okay, thank you, Dr. Smed, Dr. Fahad. So uh, going to the literature, so the incident of warfarin associated ICH is, has been estimated to be around 0.5% uh, per year in a patient with mechanical valve. It's a little bit higher patient with AFib, it's about 0.7. And we know that coagulopathy is an independent risk factor for mortality and poor functional outcome with hematoma expansion occurring within one hour in 25% of patients and within four hours in 88% of patients. And in one retrospective study, such as failure to reverse INR within two hours was an independent predictor of mortality and morbidity. So going further, in a subgroup analysis of 137 patients from, uh, from retrace one and two in 2018, they found that patients with mechanical valve who had a target INR less than 1.3 within four hours, sufficient INR reversal, with a prothrombin complex concentrate, they had a significantly decreased rate of hematoma enlargement, meaning they had a, only 20% of patients who was reversed, comparing to a patient who was not reversed, they have a hematoma expansion of about uh, 49%. 
And in the same study, there was no signal uh, saying that the ion reversal was associated with acute or delayed occurrence of uh, thromboembolic uh, complications. Uh, however, in some observational data, which is a conflicting a little bit data, the thrombotic event following prothrombin complex concentrate infusion has been estimated to be around 4 to 10 percent, with the highest risk in patients with prosthetic valve, especially patients with mitral position valve. So we have some uh, 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 con conflicting data here. However, uh, it's, it's again, observational data. So oversimplifying this, uh, so we have a thromboembolism uh, or prosthetic valve thrombosis with the reversal at worst, at worst, it's about four to 10%. With a hematoma expansion without reversal, it's uh, about 50%. So we can see that reversal seems to be here the, the, the appropriate approach. Going back to our patient, so this, the decision was made for a complete INR reversal with BCC and a 10 milligram of IV vitamin K. And the INR dropped from 6.6 .6 to 1.7. Again, did not reach the sufficient uh, INR reversal, uh, unfortunately. Uh, 24 hours brain CT showing stable finding. The INR after 24 hours has been normalized and patient remain neurologically unchanged. So now patient is stable, uh, the CT is stable. Now going to the second question, another, another clinical uh, dilemma. So about the resumption of, uh, of anticoagulation in patients with ICH with mechanical valve. So no. what's the, the option are, would you like omit anticoagulation altogether, non-wrong anticoagulation, this is a high risk patient, or you would resume it within two to 14 days, or would you resume it between 14 and 28 days, or would you resume it after 28 days? Okay. <clears throat> so again, we'll leave this around one minute for the uh, attendance to vote, and we'll discuss it afterwards. Okay, uh, Akilash, maybe if you can stop the voting and we'll see. Okay, so maybe around 28% voted. I don't know what the rest, maybe it was a difficult question. Uh, so it looks like there is a split voting between resumption within two days to 14 days, which is, I think it's quite short, and the other is 14 days to 28 days. Uh, some people will resume it after 28 and will some of them actually will will not give the patient anticoagulation at all. So I don't know, Dr. Khatri or other or one of the other panelists, what do you think? What would you do? Well, thank you very much, Jed. I think this is, uh, previous one was easier one. This one is a little bit more difficult. <laughs> but before uh, going giving my opinion on this poll, I want to make a couple of comments on what... Uh, Mohammed showed us the data that there is four to 10% risk of thromboembolic events versus 50% of hematoma expansion. But I think what this four to 10% includes all kinds of thromboembolism, not necessarily cardioembolic stroke. So that is one part. Second part that I want to comment on is know that, that hemorrhagic strokes are much more lethal than ischemic strokes. Although ischemic strokes can be fatal, but in general, we know that uh, hemorrhagic strokes are much more lethal, particularly if they are associated with large size of hemorrhage. So on that part, this 4 to 10 percent prothrombotic uh, thromboembolic risk is there, but probably it, it is much less uh, fatal or less risky than not treating the hematoma expansion. Now, with that in mind, if you think when to restart, I think these patients will need anticoagulation in long run if they survive the first event. 
if they are not critically disabled or not dead, this patient will eventually need resumption of anticoagulation. And as we said that the thrombotic part takes some time to develop. And the overall thrombotic risk is relatively less. So I would say that a safe bet will be to wait for two weeks and maybe mm -hmm. start anticoagulation between two to four weeks. But if I can convince the cardiologist to wait for four weeks, I would rather wait for four weeks, but I know this may be too risky. So my, my take will be to start within 14 to 28 days, but I probably will repeat a imaging and see that whatever the first bleed was, was stable and I don't see an ongoing continuing hemorrhagic process happening, then I'll probably feel more comfortable starting 14 to 28 days. Starting before that, I will be too scared to start unless the cardiologist can convince me that, no, I need anticoagulation now. Okay, great, uh, Dr. Uh, Hartley. Anybody from the, from the panelists would like to add? Well, I, I think as it, um, I think we don't know, uh, hmm. basically. Uh, that, that's a simple answer. Um, I think it's a trade-off between three factors. One is the hematoma expansion and recurrence of bleed in the brain or somewhere else. The second factor would be systemic uh, thromboembolism, either to the brain or to the kidneys or to the intestine or anywhere, or into the legs. And these are, all of them are serious, right? So if we emboli into the intestine, it's basically almost almost dead, right? Mm. And the third thing would be the valve clot, the mechanical valve itself. It's clot and dysfunction, so it stopped working. Um, so these three things is, is, a, is a quite interesting, but, uh, but the whole concept of medicine is built around no harm. So if you don't know what to do, do not harm. So mm. introducing medication, let the natural history go on if you don't know what to do. And that's the basic ethical principle in medicine. Um, however, um, you could see strocology is always windows, time window. TPA is a time window, you know. Uh, Revascularization is time window. Uh, thrombectomy is a, there is a, a window for, a, for, 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 for therapies and, and all of this. So stroke is all about timing. Um, which is quite interesting, always and fascinating for me. But if I have to 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 pick, would be probably between you know uh, around the tenth day, and and I pick that tenth day for my best judgment. Okay, and does that apply to all ICH related warfarin, or do you think it's in this particular case, uh, Prof Ali? For example, if a patient has AFib, as uh, Muhammad mentioned, that it can increase the risk. I know so, it's again, it's uh, so they, they typically we look a lot, a lot, a lot, we look into multiple factors that identify those high risk. And I know Muhammad is going to highlight that, and I do want to hijack his presentation. Yeah. But, um, but these are assumptions. We know that, for example, and I would love to, after Muhammad's presentation, to ask Fahad about the role of spot sign in the CTA. Would that predict hematoma growth? Mm -hmm. If we don't spot sign, would that be encouraging us to move earlier and anticoagulate? Um, if the blood pressure is treated, if there is no microplease, and many, many other factors that we can consider. But at the end of the day, it's just gut feeling, uh, Zaid. We, we don't have an evidence for that. That We, we did not okay. test them in clinical practice. It's just an observation, uh, you know, uh, expert opinion, sometimes gut feeling, sometimes we treat ourselves in, in medicine, and you know <laughs> that. Uh, but I think um, what I typically uh, do is, you know, use your best judgment, involve the cardiology people, um, family and patient, share with them this and all of us make a, a joint decisions to move forward. Uh, okay. But um, it would be very hard to justify start day six versus day nine versus day 14. I, I think we will not be able to make this dichotomy based on science.
Okay, so let's me Muhammad. Maybe there is something literature. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the so prayer to two thousand seventeen. <clears throat> We have, oh, sorry, 2018, we have no like uh, good data. It was mostly uh, a systematic review of small observational data that showing like very early resumption between seven and 10 days, maybe, maybe is the right choice. However, this is the largest thing that I have found in the literature, which was uh, titled Management of Therapeutic Anticoagulation in Patient with ICH and Mechanical Valve published in the European Society of Cardiology. And they actually, it's the combined analysis of observational cohort study of retrace one and two in 22 tertiary care center over 10 years in Germany. Uh, it was done in 2018 and they extrapolated around 137 patients with high CHM mechanical. Again, it's a small size uh, study. So what did they, sh what they showed? Uh, <clears throat> So uh, they had two outcomes that I will talk about. So uh, the first one is the hemorrhagic complication. Uh, if you see the upper graph in the red, uh, the red uh, color, so we have in the X axis, that is the number of days from ICH, and the Y axis was, uh, is the hazard ratio, meaning that the likelihood of this uh, outcome to happen. So hazard ratio of one, meaning there's no difference how is the issue more than one, meaning it is uh, more likely to happen, and has the issue less than one, meaning it's actually protective. So mm -hmm. if we look here from day one, it's clearly the hemorrhagic complication is, is, is high, and it's definitely uh, a high risk of, 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 of bleeding. And till day 13, and before day 13, the hazard ratio is about seven, with a significant p-value. Once we go beyond 13, it became an insignificant with a hazard ratio of 1.5. Looking at the other outcome in the blue color, which is, was a composite of hemorrhagic and thrombombolic complication. Again, the x-axis is the number of days after ICH to start uh, anticoagulation, and the y-axis is a hazard ratio. So from zero to 10. So hazard ratio to start anticoagulation and day one is high to get a uh, thrombotic and uh, hemorrhagic complication. And before day six, the hazard ratio is about 2.5 with a significant B value. After day six, it st starts to drop and it's non significant. So, translate, uh, translating this into clinical, uh, uh, clinical uh, significance. So, they put it onto uh, the modified drug scale and uh, for a scale. For, who, for those who don't know, modified rank scale is a scale from zero to six. Zero meaning there is no symptom, six meaning death. And the light color is more of favorable and the uh, darker color meaning unfavorable. So if we look at the composite of hemorrhagic and thrombombolic complication, it is shown here. If you start uh, thrombotic anticoagulation more than six days, the MRS, uh, there is shift from 10 in terms of mortality to two. And looking at this, the right graph with red, which was about hemorrhagic complication, if you start thrombotic anticoagulation more than 14 days, there is a shift in mortality from 12 to, to, to zero. So actually there is a mortality benefit uh, if, if you started after 14 days. So translating this, uh, I'm putting all of what I mentioned in one slide. So uh, again, this is the hazard ratio from uh, zero to 10. So from hospital admission, all patients should have an immediate reversal regardless. This is based on the, this observation data. And from day one to day six, it's a big no. There is increased risk of hemorrhage. There is increased risk of composite of hemorrhagic and, uh, and thrombotic complication. And here, if we start after 30 day, 13 days, based on this study, it's probably safe. Now we go to the middle side between six and 13 days. Those patients, you might consider starting anticoagulation in a very hybridly selected patient. For example, uh, as Dr. Said said, like some, they say, Dr. Said mentioned that someone who has a mechanical valve and AFib or mechanical valve and a thrombus, 
انت از دكتور بروف علي منشد سو اجين اذر فاكتور تو بي اذر ثينجز تو بي فاكتورد ان ذا يور ديسيجن ذا سو سبيشن تو ذا هاي ريكيرنس بليت لايك كورتيكال هيموريجز فاميلي هيستوري اوف اي سي اتش اور امايلود ان جابثي lack of treatable causes presence of of microbleeds in mri overall uh, patient condition and bleeding risk and a recent uh, bci and the need for uh, dual antiplatelet all these factors you have to factor it into your patients so what does the guideline say so the american uh, heart association american stroke association ich 2022 guideline they stated based on level C evidence and limited data in patients with spontaneous ICH and conditions placing them at high risk of thromboembolic events, for example, mechanical valve or left ventricular assist device, early resumption of anticoagulation to prevent thromboembolic complication is reasonable. In their statement, they said early without clearly saying what do they mean by early. However, in their comment, they stated The decision to start uh, restart anticoagulation at 14 days after ICH for patients with left ventricular assist device and potentially earlier in patients with mechanical valve and relatively small ICH is therefore reasonable and safe. However, they stated that this decision has to be based on assessment of uh, risk and benefits. Uh, so my take home message here Unfortunately, uh, on those critical subsets of patients, the data are scarce, and we don't have a lack, and we don't have high randomized control trial, probably due to ethical consideration or sufficiently sized observational studies exploring the optimal and the right approach to, 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 to reinitiate anticoagulation. Warfare reversal seems to be the safe, regardless of the scent of bleeding or critical stability of the patient. In most patients, warfarin resumption after 14 days seems to be a, a, a reasonable approach and case by case decision and risk benefit individualization is necessary. There are subgroup of patients that my, you might consider starting anticoagulation uh, early after the sixth day. Uh, okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you, Muhammad, actually. This is very excellent presentation, very comprehensive and challenging question. I think if you can go back to the take home figure, I think you, this is for the attendance should emphasize on that point. Uh, because we are running of, out of time, I will just take the opportunity since Dr. Fahad with us to light, to enlighten us about his recent publication. I think I agree with uh, Prof. Ali to ask uh, Dr. Fahad about the question of, uh, uh, do you think that spot sign or other imaging characteristic can help in, uh, in predicting or can delay or Uh, the starting or initiation of the anticoagulation? Definitely. I think if you have see a spot sign, I think it's, a, it's an indication that you have an active uh, bleed. However, after the 24 hours, the chance of detecting spot sign is becoming very low, especially after the reversal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the practice that we are doing in such cases is that in the first 48 hours, we start a pneumatic compression device. Then if we have two stability scan, we start DVT prophylaxis until day 14. And from day 14 until day 28, we do half of the anticoagulation. So we go from the DVT prophylaxis to have anticoagulation. And after day 28, we start full anticoagulation. Definitely, it's not an evidence-based, but it is under the insight of the evidence. Well, clearly what Muhammad showed is that The first 14 days, the chance of hemorrhage is predominant. The next days is, is the chance of embolization. It's tricky disease. If you get it right one time, you think that you are smart. Then if you mm -hmm. get it wrong, you're going to blame yourself. Uh, you know, damn if you do, damn if you don't. But I think you do it based on the best realm of evidence. And I don't think you will be successful every time. Just mm -hmm. like mechanical thrombectomy. With every evidence, we get bad case every once in a while. So don't be discouraged if you don't get it right. And don't be hyped if you get it uh, right also. Indeed, especially that the, the data or well, the literature is limited based on observation, most of it. Um, so maybe we can take some few questions from the audience. So one of the questions was if the patient developed ICH 
with the ICH develop BE? When to start anticoagulation and should we wait? <laughs> Dr. Khatri, you face this issue. Well, this is a very, <laughs> very tough question. Yes. And like we said, there is no right or wrong answer. But good news is that now we have interventionists in every field. So if I have mm. pulmonary embolism, I will ask interventionists if they can do something local or a brave surgeon to do something locally. If not, then again, this comes to the question, as Dr. Professor Ali suggested, that do no harm first. And at the same time, what is more life-threatening? If pulmonary embolism is going to kill first, then the ICH, then I will treat pulmonary embolism first. But if I believe mm -hmm. that pulmonary embolism is subsegmental or is not immediately life-threatening, then probably I will take care of brain. But of course, oh. we know that people can live in vegetative state, but people cannot live without breathing. So it's, it's, a, it's between a rock and a hard place, no right answer. But if pulmonary embolism is going to kill first, I would probably treat that. Okay. I think most of the question in the Q&A uh, roaming around the same answer. Uh, so any comments from the audience, uh, from the panelists? I think we still have one minute. So do you are telling move. me that I killed many birds with one stone? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, can I so, add uh, a thing? I, I would add uh, other comment. Um, the problem is in such cases, they you have to judge the patient personal or the individual's um, medicine. I mean, to tailor the treatment for each patient separately. Encourage the or involve the family, the patient itself, if he can, if he doesn't have any uh, symptoms limiting his decision, and the cardiologist. And the person that I have a, a, a such case, um, whenever we started with anticoagulation, he showed uh, new symptoms with intracerebral hemorrhage, and we stopped. Mm -hmm. And as Dr. Vahad um, said, we, we started with very mild anticoagulation, reaching 1.3 uh, warfarin. And now he is following with me. He is doing fine. Um, this is a success <laughs> a success case. Mm -hmm. But And, and with, with uh, PE, also the same. To start with mild um, uh, PTT-controlled um, heparin uh, treatment. This is, um, I, I know this is beyond um, guidelines, but you have to treat um, life-threatening situation. If he mm -hmm. has symptoms and you have to treat, you have to treat it. Okay, Dr. Ajmal, maybe 30 seconds only. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, this is Dr. Ajmal from uh, National Guard Hospital again. Uh, to uh, Regarding this particular case, especially the uh, uh, bleeding uh, with uh, uh, metallic valves, you need to be looking at what could be the cause as well. In this case, obviously, it's a bit hyper anticoagulator or high INR. Whether that could be, that could be, if not the actual reason, but it could be contributing. And uh, that's one, you know, when I consider, you know, uh, when to restart, like, you know, and the other, other things what we, one of the commonest uh, uh, or one of the reason is having an endocarditis or uh, having a, a mycotic aneurysm. So those things will, will change, you know, when you are going to start the anticoagulation as well. That's something I want to try. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. So we'll move to the last presentation. Uh, it's going to be by Dr. Amni al Baradi, and she's going to talk today about preoperative stroke risk assessment in patients with stroke or TIA. So Dr. Amnia, just a brief introduction. She, she did her bachelor degree in King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah, and then she joined the same center where she did her residency. Uh, later, she worked as a consultant, uh, consultant, general consultant neurology in uh, Mecca for three years. Later, she was, uh, uh, she just joined us actually uh, this year as a vascular um, neurology fellow. And Dr. Amnia, you can start now. طيب السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, and uh, I would like Amnia, to. I think Slide, your slide is not showing. Wait just a second, please. Okay, is it obvious now? Okay. Okay. 
طيب uh, first of all I would like to thank Dr. Razid for the introduction and also I want to extend my thanking to the uh, your mic is mute I think <laughs> <My dear. laughs> no, it's okay it's okay it's and okay. also can you make the presentation full screen mode yeah I will yeah What's the problem? No, we can that, hear you now well. Uh, that's fine. I, I think audio. you should be okay, Omnia. You can just... Uh, okay, sorry. I don't know why uh, you cannot hear me. No, we hear you, Omnia. I, I hear you very well. Okay. okay. Me fine. too. It's okay. So I'll just make it uh, full screen. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Dr. Zaid, for the introduction. And also, thank you for the committee for having me today. It's my great pleasure to present... Uh, I will present uh, a case that is very common and we face it like on our daily basis, which is a very operative uh, stroke risk uh, among patients with a stroke and TIA. And then I will start by uh, a case study uh, for a patient who is a 65 years old male who have a history of diabetes, hypertension, ischemic stroke before three months with a mild residual right-sided weakness. So currently the patient on Blavix, Atorvastatin, Metformin, and Lisinopril. And recently the patient was diagnosed as a case of uncomplicated gallbladder stone. And he was booked for elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So actually the patient was referred to neurology for perioperative uh, clearance. So when we reviewed this patient, uh, we reviewed his basic profile, blood profile, which was unremarkable. We did the, uh, when we reviewed the ECG, it was normal sinus rhythm. The transthoracic echo was unremarkable with the ejection fraction of 60%. And the carotid Doppler ultrasound and the brain CTA was normal. And you can see here in this figure, the brain CT for this patient, which showed a left internal capsule uh, lacunar infarct. Okay, so we'll, we'll have the first poll for this uh, scenario. Okay, so if we can have maybe one minute also, what's your plan for this patient? Either proceed with surgery, delay it for three to six months, or need further workup? Okay, Akiraj, we can stop now. Okay, so again, it seems that always our question is splitting uh, vo vote, uh, voting. So around a uh, th third or 37% proceed with surgery, 42 would ask for further workup, and only 24 actually will delay the surgery for three to six months. Uh, if you allow me all the panelists, but I would like to ask this question, particularly to Dr. Ajmal, uh, because I think when I'm covering your clinic, with you, all half of your patient coming for uh, pre-operative assessment. Uh, thanks, Zaid, for asking this question. Yes, uh, <laughs> we always get this, uh, and uh, uh, we, you know, when you look for uh, 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 the guidance, it's not, you know, it's it's sometimes it's contradicting. Anyway, I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, before before I tell the answer for this, uh, I'll tell. So having. Uh, a prior stroke is an independent risk factor for your peri uh, increased risk uh, it increases the risk of your perioperative stroke so it's an independent risk factor and this lady has got further other risk factors as well they all uh, adds up to the to her baseline perioperative stroke risk the second thing is after any stroke you know your recurrent stroke risk is there 
which is we all know that you know they are it's very high during your initial week and then it's higher in the first month and then it just comes down it may take up to a year may to reach the baseline so that's the that's the two uh, things we have okay uh, the third thing is you know this lady stroke looks like a more of lacuna stroke and if you want to look at uh, the the perioperative stroke risk there for the lacuna stroke they have got the the least uh, uh, least risk at least the mm. symptomatic one symptomatic clinical stroke which is a re- least risk okay so putting all these three together the fourth thing is the regarding the surgery itself so they say it's an asymptomatic and they're just planning for an elective surgery uh, uh, for for this gallstones now that if it is purely asymptomatic this patient never had a, a, a biliary sepsis or uh, uh, or or very adverse thing from that my suggestion would be to delay it at least 3 to 6 months i think that is my my take on for this this patient depending on you know if if, if it is if, we, if this patient had a recurrent cholecystitis but that's my my uh, approach will be different maybe you know i may even proceed earlier maybe after a month so i think that's okay. my answer for this patient excellent yeah uh, any one of the panelists one would like to add i think most of you would agree that with the same answer can i disagree Should... with it or i cannot oh Yeah, just, sure. to enrich, just to enrich the discussion i think there is also another part you know ali uh, uh, was part of the patient flow and, and command center how much i can delay the patient where he's coming from maybe he cannot come another time uh, all of these things is important uh, second thing i think if, if if the risk factor is un- under control and we are dealing with a lacuna stroke after three months uh, if you look at the literature the, the recurrence rate in such patient go very low so i think i would consider three a few things but personally if i see this case i would go with a knowing that the ideal answer is you know i think dr ajmal hit the nail on the head and his answer and his illustration was really detailed and amazing but i think a is a reasonable answer and i might pick a uh, in a daily practice okay although it's uh, even elective surgery but you would take all in consideration especially if the patient is outside or something else like that okay can i can i add something zaid here mm-hmm. so remember that a preoperative stroke is not you could have the rec- recurrent same etiology or another etiology so if the patient has a high risk for intraoperative atrial fibrillation the lacune has nothing to do with the new stroke it's coming from the heart right so it's an overall um overall assessment the other things is that is it uh, cardiac versus non cardiac um um here is clearly uh, abdominal and there are you know the, the burden of risk factors the um uh, the age is 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 a, is, a, is another factor the gender is another factor so i think it's a collective decision um you you make again um this this judgment weighing the risk and benefit considering the no harm um uh, principle um in in this case um uh, the the echo is normal the heart is okay carotids are clear no intracranial sclerosis the likelihood of having another hit of lacune is very low but the question would is she at higher risk of something else definitely uh, i i know this workup was during the three months Uh, but if this patient has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, for example, uh, which is unlikely because this is lacune, uh, or has something new in the heart, um, I would probably um, uh, add that into the the risk equation and decide. Okay. Um, to make it easy for everyone, I think uh, if it's if it's not urgent, if it's not life saving, if there is no impaired life quality. due to this due to severe pain or recurrent sepsis or recurrent admission or recurrent visit to the ar probably postponing surgery to 6 to 9 months is very reasonable okay so we can de- so we do not deviate from the presentation maybe if uh, omnia can proceed and later we'll discuss this further 
Uh, طيب. Thank you, Doctor. So we'll continue. So before answering uh, the question, uh, let's talk briefly about the perioperative stroke. Well, uh, it's defined as any embolic thrombotic or hemorrhagic stroke that occurring intraoperatively within 30 days after surgery. Regarding the incidence of perioperative stroke in the patient having surgery, it's ranging between 0.1 to 20%. And this is based on the risk factor and the procedure type. For example, for a patient who's undergoing cardiac surgery, especially the patient who's undergoing aortic surgery, the risk may reach up till 20%. On the other hand, for a patient who's undergoing non-cardiac, non-neurological surgery, the risk may be from 0.1 to 0.8. And based on that, the AHA uh, and ASA, um, they published a data or a statement in 2020 and 2021 that uh, give us a measures uh, that may help us to decrease this risk. And this strategy, uh, or uh, and this strategy, were divided into preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative uh, strategy. So, for the preoperative strategy, uh, we have four important points that we have to keep it in mind. The first important thing is the mechanism of the stroke. The second one is the risk factor. And the third one is the diagnostic workup. The fourth one is the medication, the patient on, especially the antithrombotic medication. So for the mechanism, we usually think about the previous stroke mechanism, as we said here in our patient, it's a small vessel disease, and also the mechanism that may happen in the uh, for this patient uh, based on his current risk factor and the result of the diagnostic workup that we did. So this is the first important thing that we have to think about. The second thing is the risk factor. Uh, we can divide the risk factor into patient-related factor, uh, stroke-related factor, and surgery-related factor. For the patient-related factor, usually the advanced age, female gender, the atherosclerotic risk factor, uh, history of heart disease, lung disease, or renal disease, usually uh, they have a higher risk. For the stroke, as we said, it's uh, the prior ischemic stroke. It's considered a key risk factor, especially for the type of stroke, which is cardioembolic or large vessel disease. For the surgery related, it's dependent on the type of surgery. If it's emergency surgery, if the duration of surgery was prolonged, uh, for certain type of surgery like thoracic, head and neck, intra-abdominal, vascular, transplant, and orthopedic surgery, they also have a higher risk of stroke. So this is the second point. The third point is the diagnostic workup result. For example, the patient who is having anemia, the patient who has uh, atrial fibrillation, ECG, abnormal finding in echo, um, carotid stenosis in the vascular imaging, or abnormal finding in the brain imaging, those patients will have a higher risk. So regarding the medication, as we said, the most important, the antithrombotic medication, uh, like uh, the antiplatelet and anticoagulation that we discuss, we will discuss in the next few slides. So uh, there is a suggestion from the AHAESA that they recommend to use risk assessment tool uh, like the American College of Surgeon tool and CHADS and CHAD vaso score, even in patients who is not known to have atrial fibrillation. But we have to keep in mind that those patients or these, uh, these uh, tool will not assess the risk of uh, stroke directly. On the other hand, it will assess the risk of serious complication as a whole. So after we did the, the initial evaluation for the patient, we may find uh, a special condition like extracranial carotid stenosis, intracranial stenosis, or BFO, among others. So we have to keep in mind that these things are special uh, scenarios that has to be taken in consideration separately. So regarding the antithrombotic medication, uh, we usually face the dilemma of starting or continuing antithrombotic medication with keeping in mind that the risk of bleeding is there. On the other hand, we may think about stopping the antithrombotic medication, but the risk of thromboembolism could be there. So uh, the answer of uh, this dilemma is quite difficult, but we have a four factor that we may decide upon it. So these factors include uh, the surgery, uh, the surgery type from the beginning. Is it minor surgery? Is it major surgery? The second thing is the risk of bleeding from this surgery. The third point is if the uh, stroke risk is high or low for this patient. And the last point, why the patient on this antithrombotic medication? So the indication. For example, patient on antiplatelet for a peripheral chronic vascular disease is not like a patient who is an aspirin for a recent stenting. 
So if we keep if we keep these four things in mind, we may be able to uh, decide about uh, continuing or hold, holding antithrombotic medication. In case we want to hold the antithrombotic medication, here you can find the AHA recommendation regarding the timing, when to hold and when to resume. And we need to be familiar with these uh, numbers. Uh, the other medication that was uh, mentioned in the AHA statement is the beta blocker. And based on this trial, which is the BOYS trial that, uh, um, that uh, published in 2008, uh, actually this trial was conducted among uh, 8,351 patients in around 190 hospitals in different countries. And they actually investigate the effect of preoperative beta blocker. Uh, they have, uh, they uh, actually um, divided the patient to receive metoprolol and the other group to receive placebo. And the patient who received metoprolol actually started it within two to four hours before the surgery and continue it, uh, and they continue on it for 30 days. The primary endpoint was the cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, cardiac arrest. But what was the important for us is the risk of uh, stroke. So uh, they found that more patients in the metoprolol group than in the placebo group had a stroke. And also based on post hoc analysis, which is not shown here, that they found uh, that uh, the reason of uh, or underlying mechanism of having DC stroke in those patient was hypotension and bradycardia. So based on that, the American Heart Association in 2013, they recommend to continue on beta blocker in patients who are already on it for a long time period. But they recommend or they uh, suggest avoiding starting or initiating beta blocker at the same time or the same day of surgery. So other important point to keep in consideration is the timing of surgery like our patients. So there is two observational study that showed that the risk of preoperative stroke was higher for patients with a recent ischemic stroke. And this risk was there up to 12 months uh, post the last stroke or after the last stroke. So they recommend uh, for the patient who's undergoing elective non-cardiac surgery to be deferred at least six months, um, possibly as long as nine months after last ischemic stroke. And this is to reduce the risk of preoperative stroke. So for the intraoperative period, the most likely mechanism was embolic in 80% of the patient and hypoperfusion in 20%. And uh, the strategy to avoid including blood pressure management. Uh, well, we have to be very careful about the blood pressure management, especially in patients who's having like intracranial or extracranial carotid stenosis. But actually, there is no sufficient guideline to 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 have a target of uh, blood pressure during the surgery. And according to that, the AHA they recommend to have mean arterial pressure or MAP to be above seventy for patients who had a uh, previous stroke. Uh, the second point regarding the, cho uh, the choice of anesthesia. So there is also no sufficient data uh, to support the use of, for example, general over uh, uh, regional anesthesia or vice versa. So the, the decision should be based on the patient condition, uh, the type of surgery and the patient factor. Uh, the third point is the management of anemia. So significant anemia has to be treated. But again, we do not have any evidence regarding which target or cut point that we have uh, to start blood transfusion at it. So the AHA again recommend uh, start blood transfusion for all patient or most of the patient if the hemoglobin drop below eight. But they also recommend to start it for patient uh, who's having high risk of stroke based on the risk factor that we mentioned if the hemoglobin drop uh, below nine. Uh, regarding the surgical technique, there are a specific uh, technique uh, for, especially for the cardiac surgery, including the uh, avoiding aortic manipulation, the left uh, atrial appendage closure, and atrial fibrillation ablation. But uh, these strategy uh, should be discussed with the uh, cardiac surgeon, uh, the cardiac surgeon. So for the post-operative period, the mechanism either early or late. So for the early, it's if it, the stroke happened within the seven days, and half of these cases occur actually within the first 24 hours. Uh, for the late period, which is usually from seven days to 30 days, most of the mechanism for the early period, especially in the cardiac, uh, in the patient who undergo, uh, undergone cardiac surgery, is due to arrhythmia and mainly post-operative atrial fibrillation with a percentage reaching to 40%. And most of the uh, cases who had a stroke from seven days to 30 days or late period 
are generally due to atherosclerotic risk factor. So what's the strategy to avoid? We usually say that uh, an CC effect reversal as early as possible is important in order so we can do frequent clinical assessment uh, and to look for any abnormal uh, new focality in the neurological examination. And also all hospitals should have a very operative stroke protocol in for the inpatient group um, and especially for the patient uh, who have a, a recent surgery. Regarding the reperfusion re therapy, if the patient uh, confirmed to have a stroke, actually for thrombolysis or TPA, we do not have evidence-based medicine uh, because simply most of the trial, they exclude the surgical patient from the trial. So um, TPA is generally contraindicated or relatively contraindicated, but we can consider it in some kind of patient if the bleeding risk is low and of course after discussing the case with the uh, involved surgeon. Uh, regarding the mechanical thrombectomy, it's considered mostly safe uh, in most of the patient if the patient uh, fulfilled the criteria for uh, mechanical thrombectomy. So finally, let's go back to our patients. Uh, so in the preoperative period, we calculated the American College ACS uh, of surgeon stroke and his uh, uh, risk of stroke was less than 1%. So we prefer to postpone his surgery from three to six months, keeping in mind that his surgery is elective. And, uh, uh, and this is, of course, after discussion with the uh, surgical team. Regarding the antiplatelet, we recommend to hold the Blavix from five to seven days prior to surgery and to resume it once the risk of surgical bleeding is diminished, but also to, to keep in mind that there is a modest risk of preoperative stroke. Regarding the intraoperative, again, we recommend to keep the blood pressure above 70 regarding the postoperative period, as we just mentioned, the postoperative strategy, again, to control, uh, to, to insist or uh, to insist on the controlling the, uh, the patient atherosclerotic risk factor. So take home messages uh, from uh, this topic is that the preoperative stroke is associated with a significant public health burden and strategy to assess a perioperative stroke risk, including patient risk factor, the estimated stroke mechanism, and the medication management are very important. Cases like BFO, carotid stenosis, intracranial stenosis need special consideration, and intraoperative blood pressure management monitoring is vital. Finally, early diagnosis and treatment of post-operative stroke is crucial to have a better outcome and quality of life for the patient. Thank you. Thank you, super presentation. And the, I think one of the most, if not the most common consultation question in neurology. Um, so with that, uh, I would like to ask one question. It's actually an interest of mine. And I would like to thank, uh, to ask the prof and maybe you can close after. So prof, uh, one of the common things is sometimes we get referral for a preoperative clearance of patient who had a stroke. I will give you a scenario. He had a stroke maybe, he's a 60, he had a stroke eight years ago. He's maintained an aspirin and currently he's, he has no symptoms. And they want, he wants to go, for example, as the surgery or abdominal or bariatric surgery and they ask for clearance. So do you have anything that's let's say basic investigation or would you ask for the whole stroke workup? Oh, that, that, that's a difficult question. So someone who had, um, and I see this in my clinic, sometimes someone who, was, who had silent infarction in a CT scan that was done six years ago, or someone who's been on aspirin for 10 years for all TIA, and he comes today for, uh, for um, uh, preoperative uh, stroke risk assessment. Um, honestly, um, there is no data to guide us. And, and what we do is that uh, it, it's different from practitioner to practitioner and depends on uh, the accessibility to diagnostics, the anesthesia uh, group. Um, if, uh, the old, if I have a data on the old stroke, um, that's making me comfortable and I didn't repeat them. Um, but I don't go beyond what is the usual care um, or the usual assessment based on the anesthesia uh, routine assessment for um, for uh, non-stroke patients. Again, you assess the risk factors. Uh, you take the cons in consideration the 
you know, the overall picture, uh, the anti-coagulation uh, uh, slash anti-platelets. And I estimate the risk the way uh, Omnia has uh, mentioned, but I do not repeat, for example, CTNG or do an MRI to further characterize the risk. And I don't think there is any data, but I would love to hear from the rest of the panel. Maybe Fahad, Fahad, what do you think? Well, I, I would do the same. And I don't think that we have a lot of data to guide us regarding these things. But uh, usually most of the consultation about either old embolic or a lacunar stroke. If the old embolic, then we are talking about anticoagulation management. And if the risk factor is managed after six months uh, from lacunar stroke, I think that the risk factor goes to the very low zone so this is where I don't repeat the work. Of just I insist on controlling blood pressure and A1C and lipid profile. Okay. Uh, so maybe because we are running out of time, if the uh, committee can allow us for a few minutes. Uh, so Dr. Omni, I think people are asking about beta blocker. Maybe if you can re-explain it to them. Uh, okay, sure. So the question is, uh, do but uh, just to be specific, do we stop metabrolol if patient on it prior to surgery? Uh, no, actually the guideline was recommending continuing on it if the patient already on it, but okay. not to initiate it for naive patient at the day of surgery. Okay. So some one of the question is, uh, would you thrombolyze if the thrombolysis or alteblase or tenectablase is contraindicated? What would be the acute management? I think that depends if the patient has large vessel occlusion, you would go if there is if it's contraindicating. I don't think there is much we can add. Uh, so one of the question is uh, patient, maybe one of the panelists can take this patient admitted with a fracture in the left hip and subarachnoid hemorrhage. When what is your approach? I mean, it depends on the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Is this enlistment or is this traumatic? It looks mm -hmm. like traumatic and, and because of the fracture and fall. Um, otherwise, if the uh, intercerebral uh, or the subarachnoid hemorrhage um, is um, aneurysmal, um, I would treat it before because it is life threatening. And they can, the surgeon can stabilize the hip fracture. And they usually they wait sometimes uh, almost one week if. The patient have medical um, issues, so I would go depends on the etiology or the cause of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, I would um, do the treatment for subarachnoid hemorrhage before the um, orthopedic uh, fixation of the fracture. Okay, thank you, Dr. Abdal. And uh, at the end, we'd like to thank again the uh, the Minasul for organizing this and the attendance for staying with us until this late time. Uh, Prof. Ali, if you want to close with any comment or statement. No, it was a great night. Thank you so much for, for moderating this. Zaid was really wonderful. Thank you for the speakers, for our great fellows. I, I really learned from you and I enjoyed your presentations. Really, really amazing. Uh, the audience are more than almost more than 600 people watching us. The panelists were uh, uh, wonderful. The discussion was great. I enjoyed it. Thank you for everyone. And again, thank you for the NASA group to host us. And we would be happy every month to come uh, and bring our cases and share it with you. And uh, and again, uh, have a great night. And uh, thank you, Zaid. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. And thank you for the panelists, all of you, for uh, your comments.